Thank you. So, hi. Um, hi, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Bincy. I'm the Heart Failure Services Lead from BHRUT. And along with me is Dr. Saad Sahicha, who is also the lead, uh, consultant cardiologist, and Caroline Sevent, who is a, a heart failure nurse as well. So together, we're going to present uh, this topic on heart failure. Can you guys hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you clearly. No, thank you. And um, so is there anybody, I mean, can you put the videos on? Can I see? I feel like I'm seeing a black screen with some names here and there. Is there anybody who... Can you put the videos on by any chance? No? Okay. Yeah, so we've got, I can see Tracy, Susie. Okay, Atta. thank you. Yep. Thanks a lot. I, I think I'm, I'm the one who's not seeing much, but anyway, thank you. Um, so basically um, the topic is heart failure. And uh, I just wanted to ask a simple question. What is um, What are the signs and symptoms you can see in heart failure? Right? Um, is can I get some answers? All of them. All of them. Good. Thank you. Any more? Yes or no's or. <laughs> okay. Okay. All of them. I think I can see all of them. Much more common there. So yep. Thank you. So that is what I, so I know you guys, um, we were told that it was a wide variety of people. So we have um, made it as simple. So if, please forgive us if it's too simple uh, for you guys, uh, because uh, we are just trying to, um, you know, it's present to everyone. So please uh, forgive us if it's too simple. So basically um, to start with, um, I'm going to ask Temi to uh, take uh, like, uh, help me with the slide. So, Timmy, can we go to the next one, please? So, what is heart failure? So, basically, heart failure is a syndrome in which uh, patients should have the uh, following features. So, there are two types. So, it's one is they should have symptoms of heart failure, or they should have objective ev evidence of abnormality of the structure or the function of heart at rest. So they should have both of them. So either they should have the symptoms of heart failure, which as you have all said, um, it's, it should include shortness of breath at rest or on exertion, fatigue. And then if you have signs of fluid retention, which can be either pulmonary congestion, ankle, um, peripheral edemas and abdominal distension. And also the second thing they need to have is um, evidence of abnormalities of the structure or the function of the heart at rest. Second slide, please. So heart failure is basically a clinical syndrome and the cardinal symptoms, the main symptoms you could all see is breathlessness. That's what the patient would say, breathlessness, swelling of their ankles and fatigue. The signs you can, you can see is peripheral edema, raised JVP and crackles. Um, they, are, they are caused by your structural or functional cardiac abnormalities. And this, um, this uh, results in reduced cardiac output and elevated intracardiac pressures. So next slide, please. So this heart failure is often associated with marked reduction. As we said before, it's, it really leads to a marked reduction in the quality of life. And so it leads, it, it's a more of a debilating condition where the patients feel like it really affects them, um, their life uh, altogether, their, um, their quality of life altogether. They, they have increased morbidity, mortality, and they have a high risk of readmission. So that is the reason why we need to um, like try to diagnose heart failure earlier. It's earlier diagnosis, better management as well, because uh, 900,000 people in UK is currently living with heart failure. And um, this, this uh, admission accounts, the heart failure care and accounts for about 2% of the annual NHS budget. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So types of heart failure, can anybody tell us, uh, according to their um, left ventricular ejection fraction, would you be able to tell me how, what are the types of heart failure you see? Any answers? I have the slide in front, so if you want, you can read through it. 
Okay, I can see they're a very shy group. So let me try to say it. So we have uh, three types according to the left ventricle. We, we like it's, uh, it's the ESC guideline says there are three types of heart failure according to terminologies based on their left ventricular ejection fraction. That's the epi um, ca uh, capacity of the left ventricles pumping ability capacity. So it's, a, it's, it's called heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And this, um, this is the maximum uh, we see they are the patients who have ejection fraction less than 40%. Uh, so, um, and then we have heart failure, mildly reduced ejection fraction or mid-range ejection fraction. So these are the patients which are neither um, in the reduced ejection fraction nor in the preserved ejection fraction. So they are somebody who have ejection fraction ranging from 40 to 49%. So, and the heart failure preserved ejection fraction is the, obviously the ones who have ejection fraction over 50%. So we have uh, mild, uh, we have reduced ejection fraction is less than 40%. If we have a mildly reduced ejection fraction, we have 40 to 49. And then you have the HEFPEF, which is the preserved ejection fraction which is over 50%. And both in the mildly reduced ejection fraction and the HFPF, you have to have also raised BMP uh, uh, levels and also one additional criteria, like they should have either a structural heart disease, like you will have a left ventricular hypertrophy or the left atrial enlargement and diastolic or, or the diastolic dysfunction. So these are the things which you will see in both of them. With um, the heart failure reduced ejection fraction, you have certain prognostic medication, which Dr. Sahicha will be talking about in the um, going forward. With the heart failure, mildly reduced ejection fraction, these and, and the HFPF, usually they are managed by, uh, if they have patient have signs of fluid overload, you give them diuretics or you manage, actively manage their comorbidities. That's how we uh, manage these patients. Um, uh, we all we have um, the um, the reduced ejection fraction. Obviously, we we have a proper management, like what all medications we can start and what all devices we can uh, like devices which we can offer. Any questions still here? Am I too fast or is it okay? Mm, chats. Okay. So far, no answers. So I'm just going forward. I can't see you guys. So maybe I'm just, if I'm jumping forward. Oh, thanks a lot, Tracy. I can see only one or few people on my thing. So uh, please bear with me if I don't um, uh, ask every one of you. So the next, uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Demi? So the next slide is, as we discussed uh, before, when to suspect heart failure. And as you guys have already said, if you find this, there are symptoms of shortness of breath at rest or exertion, if you find the patient is complaining of fatigue, or if they have patient has signs of fluid retention, these are the patients you are going to suspect they are having heart failure. Um, so can we have the next slide, please? So these are the clinical features of acute heart failure. So you on one side we have put on. Uh, parts of fluid overload or congestion, and the other side is hypoperfusion. Um, so the, the main symptoms with fluid overload, you can see is orthopenia, where you feel the patient finds it hard to lie down flat. They always, um, they tend to, you can ask this question by simple, how many pillows do you need? Have you noticed that you have to have increased amount, amount of pillows uh, while sleeping? Sorry, Tracy can't see the slide. Is there any? Sorry, I can't see what slide. Um, there's a message that I can, some some of them can't see slides, but some I can. can. Okay, maybe you just need to log in and log out again. Sure. Sorry for the inconvenience. We'll try to sort it out. I can see the slide, but obviously... Yep. Yeah. Can you see this slide? When to suspect heart failure, Tracy? Oh, I can't. I'll log out and log back in again. Can everyone okay. see it? Yeah. 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 Every, okay. Most of them can see it, Tracy. So, okay. Can I continue, Tammy? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So the other, as I said, the clinical features, as I said previously, the fluid overload, you, you can see is orthopenia, as I said, 
it, it, it's easy way to find out is if you ask the patients, do you feel that you need an increased number of pillows while sleeping? So because patients do suffer from, uh, they complain that they can't sleep flat, they need to sleep upright, or they see, they have noticed a, uh, they need increased number of pillows. So that's called orthopenia. And then we have PND or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea when the patient complains that they wake up feeling breathless or they are, some people say they feel like they're gasping for air or they feel like they're drowning. These are the signs of fluid overload. Also peripheral edema, this is something we can see. You can see swelling which starts on the ankle. It can go up to shin. Um, it can go up to the thigh. Some people have it on the private areas. Some people end up having abdominal distension, sacral edema. So this is like a widespread, uh, you can see. Also, um, you can also notice this a raised JVP or the jugular vein pressure. So you can, when you assess the patient, you can see the JVP is raised and you can auscultate. You can see a crackles, preps as well. Um, obviously, you can also see a here a gallop rhythm and notice ascites. That's also another thing we can see. And also we find out hepatic distension. The other side is called hypoperfusion. So this, because when heart failure occurs, you also have tend to have hypoperfusions uh, because it's not enough blood supply. So we can see signs of tachycardia, narrow pulse pressure, um, uh, cool extremities and poor, poor peripheral, um, poor capillary uh, confusion, some people, oliguria, dizziness, and they can also complain of lactate. This is usually in the hospital settings we are able to uh, find out much easier. So, but the only thing we wanted to prove in this that hypoperfusion is not synonymous with hypotension, but people always associate hypoperfusion and hypotension. So that's the reason why we put that slide there. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, these are certain pictures of what you would see. You can see, you can see the um, uh, edema, peripheral pitting edema. That's if you press it, you can see your hand you know, your finger, you can see the mark of your finger on the um, per patient's uh, leg or on there. I think this is called signs of, this is our signs you can see. So can we go to the next slide, please? So the next slides onwards, I think Dr. Sahicha will be um, uh, letting you know about the investigations and about um, medications and device therapy. Um, if you have any questions till now, feel um you can ask now or you can wait till the end of this other uh, session. Oh. Oh, thank you, Vincy. Um, thank you. If there aren't any questions, I'll, I'll um, carry on. I'm Dr. Sage, I'm a cardiologist based here at uh, uh, Queen's and King George Hospital. So in terms of the investigations that you'd want to do, for heart failure, the, the key test really is the NT pro BNP, the brain natriuretic peptide, and that's elevated with with any sort of structural abnormality uh, to do to do with the heart. So it's very good. Uh, a negative BNP of less than four hundred is very good at excluding heart failure. Um, if oh, did you hear me? Yes. Oh, I think there's uh, some feedback. That, Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So there's some feedback that not everyone should hear. It's a bit of a mixed, uh, the it's mixed, mixed feedback. Yeah. Let me try and... It's quite... Is that, is that any better? That's very faint. Mm, I can hear you clearly. Yeah, I can Does hear fine. Want... Yeah, does everyone want to put their speakers up or so? Because the, the recording's pretty loud. Is it? Well, for me, it is. I've got my speaker all the way to the top. Okay. I'll, I'll speak um, louder and see if that helps. Um, so I don't know how much of that you you, you heard, but I, I, my name's Dr. Sahitja. I'm a cardiologist at uh, King George and uh, Queen's Hospital. I'm just going to talk about the investigations for, for heart failure. So the, the key investigation is the, the NT pro BNP, the, the brain natriuretic peptide. And that's an excellent test um, for excluding heart failure. So if, if the value is less than 400, you're very unlikely to, to have heart failure. If it's elevated, it can be elevated because of heart failure, but it can also be elevated for, for other conditions as well. Um, 
what 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 does would anyone um, like to suggest some conditions that your BMP can be elevated in, uh, but not have a diagnosis of heart failure? Are there any any suggestions from the old age? Um, possibly. Um, anything else? Not one that, that comes straight to mind, but I think if you've got if you've got if you tend to be elderly, then you may have you know, renal dysfunction, which may, which may increase your, your BNP. Um, but I mean, old age per se, I don't think is a reason for the BNP to be elevated. PE, yeah, that's, that's a good one. So any, the PE will cause a, a, a rise in your, your BNP um, acutely. Um, do you know why that is? Why would it, why would it cause a why would the PE cause a rise in the um, BNP? So it's, yeah, good. So yeah, good. Yeah. So any any um, so right ventricular stress. So uh, there's increased uh, hemodynamic effects because of the PE. So any sort of um, impact this has on the heart will cause the BNP to to, to raise. Um, the other, the other sort of common condition that can cause it, another cardiac condition that we see a lot of patients being referred to the BNP clinic with, um, is another common common cardiac condition that puts puts it up. LVH, yeah, good. So hypertension, LVH, another common um, condition that you might come across. Cardiac condition. Yes, excellent. AF. So atrial fibrillation causes um, an increase in the left atrial dimensions, the left atrial remodels, and that can put your BMP up. So essentially anything that causes a change in the structure of the heart or impacts on the structure of the heart or the function of the heart has the capacity to put the BMP up. So BMP is important. Um, what about, yeah, hey, Hokum, yeah, that's a good one. That, that will put, put your blood pressure up as well. Um, what about full blood count? Why is, why is that important for um, patients with heart failure? Because we, as Vinci mentioned earlier, these, yeah, excellent. Yeah, so these patients, they present with, with breathlessness and you want to exclude anemia. Often patients with, with heart failure do have the iron deficiency. Um, so you'd, like, you'd want to check their iron, uh, you know, the hematinics as well. Uh, use and ease, what, why would that be important for a, a patient with, with heart failure? Well, it can, it can help in terms of uh, prognosis. We know often that patients who have poor renal function and poor heart function, that's not a very good uh, combination. It can also help in terms of tailoring you know, medications such as you know, or, you know, heart failure medications. Can, yeah, exactly. They can affect the, the, the coming the AKI and diuretics. So the medications that we give to treat heart failure have an impact on, on kidney function. LFTs, um, if you've got poor LV function that can sometimes cause hepatic uh, congestion and derangement of the LFTs. TFTs are important because you want to exclude uh, you know, thyroid toxic state or hy hypothyroidism, which can be associated with heart failure. So there's important and um, glucose to check for, for diabetes. So there's important sort of baseline tests that you do, including the BMP. Um, it's also quite important to do an ECG. Um, wh wh why would an ECG be, be helpful in someone that you suspect has got heart failure? What would you be looking for in an ECG? Yeah, good. So underlying ischemic heart disease. Um, so there might be, there might be pointers as to the etiology of the heart failure. So they might have, you know, Q waves anteriorly, they might have had a previous anterior infarct. 
there might be some ischemic changes on the ECG. Often you get bundle branch blocks that can be associated, that left bundle branch block can be associated with hypertension, it can be associated with, with heart failure, and we'll come on to talk about that a bit later on. Uh, chest x-ray is important. Uh, what, what sort of, what would you expect to see on the chest x-ray? Yeah, so you'd see an enlarged heart or lung pathology. So you, you may see cardiomegaly, you may see that the cardiothoracic ratio is greater than 50%. You may see signs of uh, pulmonary edema. The echocardiogram is important because that gives you, um, yeah, that gives you the, the left ventricular function and that can give you a, an idea of the underlying etiology. Um, does anyone know what, what they would look for in an echo in, in order to decide between a particular etiology? Would they, you know, if you received an echocardiogram from the community, what, 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 what sort of telltale signs would there be with regards to the etiology? So I think what, yeah, good. So valvular problems, pulmonary artery pressure, ejection fraction. So excellent. So all these causes of, 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 of heart failure. Um, so valvular disease is important. Do they have underlying hypertension? Do they have LVH? Is that, is that the underlying cause of the heart failure? You want to see what the ejection fraction is so you can you can put them into those, those different brackets. You know, is this is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, mid-range ejection fraction, or preserved ejection fraction. I think one of the one of the key help, you know, helpful indicators is whether there's a regional motional abnormality or whether this is global dysfunction. So if it's global dysfunction, that tends to point towards, you know, perhaps a dilated cardiomyopathy, perhaps a history of alcohol excess. Whereas if you've got regional wall motion abnormalities, that points more towards an ischemic background. So I think broadly speaking, when you look at the, the um, you know, you look at the, the echocardiogram reports, if there isn't any significant valvular disease, I would look at the, 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 the nature of the dysfunction as to whether it's global or whether it's regional, because that can give you a, not always, but that can give you an idea of whether or what the underlying etiology might be. And you need to try and fit that in with the, with the clinical context. Um, in terms of further imaging, you can do cardiac MRI scan, uh, myocardial perfusion scan, and, and, and coronary angiography. But that, that was something that would, that would usually be organised uh, via secondary care. Uh, next slide, please. So natriuretic peptides, as, as we said, they're, they're, they're increased whenever there's any change in the loading conditions of the heart. And they're excellent at excluding heart failure. Um, when they're elevated, they can point to the severity of the heart failure and, and the need for assessment, the urgency of the need for assessment. But you need to, to, to treat um, elevated um, natriuretic peptides with a bit of caution because they can be elevated with other common conditions, particularly CKD, atrial fibrillation is the other big condition that where it tends to be elevated. Next slide, please. So in terms of the, the ECGs, um, you know, it's, it's a rarely normal in, in, in heart failure and they've got a good uh, predictive value um, and it can give you an idea of what the underlying etiology is. Does the patient have atrial fibrillation that's poorly controlled? Do they have a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy? Do they have a left bundle associated with hypertension? Um, do they have a dilated cardiomyopathy with, with left, broad left bundle? So the ECG can give you some ideas as to what the underlying etiology is and is an important investigation for heart failure. Uh, next slide, please. So as we, as we alluded to earlier, you can see this is a classic uh, chest X-ray of the patient with heart, heart failure. You've got... Um, blunting of the costophrenic angles and you've got pleural effusion bilaterally. Uh, you've got a raised, um, increased, cardi increased uh, cardiac size with cardiomegaly um, and you've got congestion in the hyla consistent with pulmonary edema. Next slide, please. 
So the ECHO, as we, as we alluded to earlier, is the gold standard test, and that helps to differentiate systolic and diastolic dysfunction. And importantly, it gives us the ejection fraction, which helps us guide um, uh, medications and guides how we treat patients uh, according to the, the prognostic medications. Next slide, please. So in terms of the management of heart failure, there's um, the pharmacological therapies, uh, device therapy, and uh, bridging and transplantation. So next slide, please. So there's really, there's, there's four pillars in terms of, so this is for the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So those patients with an ejection fraction below 40%, there are four pillars that, that, uh, of, of treatment. So there are four prognostic medications. And this really is a take home message in terms of the treatment of heart failure reduced ejection fraction. So you've got ACE inhibitors um, or ARNIs, which are angiotensin receptor uh, neprilysin inhibitors, uh, secubital valsartan. There's beta blockers and there's MRA or mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. And um, a more recent addition to, to this uh, is, are the SGLT2 inhibitors, dapaglobosin and empaglobosin. And these have been shown well, to help reduce um, hospitalization and mortality associated with, with heart failure. Um, next slide, please. So this is, this is taken from the, the ESC, the European Society of Cardiology. And you can really, you can just see it at, at the top, you've got the, the, the four key prognostic medications. So your ACE inhibitor or your ARNI, which is your angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor, your beta blocker, your MRA, and then your SGLT2 inhibitors. Those, those are the four prognostic medications. And there's a class one indication for uh, giving patients these, these uh, the medications. Diuretics don't have a prognostic benefit, but they can be used to help um, congestion. Um, so it's really, there's been a sort of change in the way we manage patients with heart failure. So we used to start off with, you know, analogous with, with the trials, you'd start off with your ACE inhibitor, you'd up titrate that, then get, get them onto a beta blocker, and then your MRA. But now that the, the sort of school of thought has changed, that these, these medications are complementary and it's best to try and get patients on small doses as, as quickly as possible. So rather than that sort of approach, the stepwise traditional approach, uh, which sort of correlated with, with, the, with the trials, it's the, the, the school of thought is now to try and get patients on these medications as quickly as possible. And something that may have taken six months before, you're looking at trying to do, um, you know, in, in around four weeks, four to six weeks. So you want to get these patients on the optimized on these four medications, and then what? Once they've been optimized, you want to assess them for whether they would require a device. And the, the cutoff figure is is thirty five um, percent. So I think you just need to be aware that patients with um, an ejection fraction of below thirty five percent who are optimized may be may be um, a candidate for uh, a defibrillator or a cardiac resynchronization. Uh, therapy uh, device. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide's, uh, this slide's a little bit busy, but this just shows that, uh, just to be aware that for, for patients with heart failure who are optimized um, with injection fraction that remains below 35%, you can consider them for a defibrillator or a cardiac resynchronization therapy device. And that's based on the the left bundle branch block because the left bundle branch block gives a measure of the synchrony and how well they're going to respond to cardiac resynchronization therapy and um, also the, the NOHA class status. So this is taken from the NICE guidance on uh, device implantation. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, this is this is a, a device where you, you can see three, three wires. This is a, a CRT device and you can see um, there's a battery that sits on top of the muscle there's uh, a wire that goes into to the right ventricle 
and there's a wire that goes into the left ventricle via the coronary sinus. And that six doesn't, that's not in the left ventricle per se, but it sits in the epicardial drainage of the, the left ventricle. And then there's, there's a wire in the top there in, in the, the right atrial appendage. So this is a CRT device. This helps to re resynchronize the, the, the heart pump and patients with a broader left bundle get a better um, effect. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna, uh, I think this is gonna be taken on by one of my colleagues the next few slides. Uh, yeah. I'll take any questions at the end. Hello there, sorry. Great, yeah, yeah. carry on. Yeah, I'm Carol. I'm one of the heart failure nurses. I'm sorry if you can't see me. I couldn't connect to the um, computer, so I'm on my iPhone. So if you can bear with me and just listen, if that's okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah we yeah. can hear you. Okay, hello there. Yeah, what I'm going to speak about now is about palliative and end of life care. And the first thing I want to talk about is the advanced care planning. And the with the advanced care planning, it is a voluntary process of a person um, senses discussion between an individual and their care providers about their preferences and priorities for the future. Um, obviously managing symptoms in the last few months and weeks is um, quite vital um, to um, heart failure patients and they really do need, sometimes people are wondering what advice and support they can get. And with having this advanced care plan in place, it, it helps with better clinic patient dialogue and a better understanding in a planned care so that when it comes to the latter part of a person's life, that there's actually a management plan, um, working management plan in place, which can um, cause um, less confusion and obviously less distress to both patients and their family members. And secondly, can enhance a shared decision-making approach. And thirdly, it's synchronizing um, advanced care planning across the medical um, speciality so that as a result, each person that um, is in um, helping and the latter part of life, for instance, you have the community heart failure nurses, which work coincide with the actual palliative care nurses. So that we all have actually got, and then if their preference is, um, we say hospice, or whether their preference would be that it actually, um, some people wish to come into hospital for the latter part of their life, but quite a considerable amount of people would prefer to be at home. Hence, when they are actually in hospital, Hospital, then um, it would be a priority, obviously, to get um, those patients home so they can actually spend their last um, few days or hours at home with a package of care in place to help and support. And also, it's, um, I think, truly listening to their concerns and support is obviously quite important. Um, and to have a plan document in place, as I said, is, is really important part of all our um, plan. Then the second part, obviously, is um, coming to the latter part of life. Um, sometimes people have um, an ICD, um, which is internal cardiac defib in place. You can have, um, we say, um, a CRTD, this is called, which is um, combined of both a pacemaker and a defib. And this, and you also have a, we call a CRTD, which is a cardiac resistance um, therapy with a pacemaker, um, which is for a pacemaker, but the one that we really would be talking about here is the CRTD, which has got an ICD deactivation part in it. When they're coming to the latter part of life, um, it is good to have um, this as part of our advanced care plan, where it is appropriate to have an, um, a discussion with the patient um, and family. And this is to do a management plan, particularly if the co-management was said it's, it's come to the decision that they do not resuscitate order and an implantable um, defib can be confused to patients and healthcare professionals. But the dying patients are at risk of obviously receiving an inappropriate and unpleasant electric shocks from the ICD if they develop ventricular tachycardia or ventricular safe fibrillation in their terminal phase of life. If an ICD is not deactivated prior to the death, there is a risk after that, that the movement of the body may stimulate the ICD and to deliver inappropriate shocks, which can be actually very distressing. So that would be one part when a discussion is about do not de um, 
resuscitate that also to um, have a discussion uh, in similar time with, about the ICD deactivation and obviously to clarify that if they do have a pacemaker as I said in this, the CRTD that to um, clarify that the actual pacemaker part isn't being switched off it would be the um, ICD part and of course what would be very important then is to have in some patients and there has been a few where they do make the decision that they would pref preference is to leave the device on until the latter part and then that would be important important obviously that we document this quite clearly so that all people involved in the care um, actually do um, adhere to what and, and to know what the actual plan is in the latter part. Then um, if we can go to the next slide please. Okay, and what we are talking to now is about um, the BMP referral criteria, and um, because part of our job is where we actually um, do uh, look through the the BMP referrals and triage them appropriately, and. Some things, this is just about what is included in when the referrals come in, is that the NB Pro BMP level, anything is acceptable between 400 to 2000. And that's normally, it can be a six week wait. Although presently that is actually considerably longer than that because we've had quite an amount of um, increase in numbers of um, actual referrals are being made. And secondly, then, if the bro BMP level is greater than 2000, that would normally be a, a two week wait um, pathway. And with this, that would be access for um, uh, a cardiology consultant appointment plus um, an echocardiogram on the same day so that they can see if um, actually heart uh, failure is um, a cause of the actual symptoms that they're having. And then the exclusion criteria would be um, patients that are already known to have um, a diagnosis of heart failure. And if they've had an echocardiogram done within a year, and if the, the pro BMP results are over three months old, and then also if the patient is bed bound, housebound patients can be accepted if they're happy to travel um, because we have um, where they can come into us, um, we say, on, on a wheelchair brought in by family um, or, or ambulance or whichever is appropriate. Then if the patient was previously seen in the BMP clinic within a year and also if the patient is under active cardiology follow-up care, and this is in accordance with NICE guidelines in 2018. And can I have next slide, please? Our refer the referral pathway to the BMP clinic, which is for new heart failure diagnostic clinic, is um, we do have on the ERS, which is um, a referral form um, to be completed. And in this, um, we uh, would like the clinical um, summary. Um, ideally, it should include um, a recent DCG, but that, as I said, is not um, mandatory. Um, and this needs to be submitted through the ERS um, system. And all referrals we usually triage within the first 48 hours. Um, but obviously this excludes the weekends and bank holidays. Um, referral outcomes are sent back through the ERS with um, a management plan and actual, um, we say if the BMP is greater than um, 2000, as said be two week, anything from four to one less than just 2000 would be the six weeker. And those that are under 400 um, obviously wouldn't be appropriate uh, to be sending um, to the, this actual uh, pathway. Um, referral outcomes, as I said, are sent back. Um, Non-referrals -refer will be returned or rejected if the forms are not appropriately filled. Um, sorry, can I have the next slide, please? And this is just what the actual form looks like. Well, we are in the process of um, updating this form as well, because I do believe there has been um, some older forms that sometimes are sent in. And um, though I think there was one that's quite considerably old, which suggested that because if they had AF or previous MI, that a pro BMP um, blood test wasn't appropriate um, or needed, but that's not the case. I mean, obviously through this pathway, that is what we would uh, need to, um, a pro BMP um, blood um, test. And Caden, and I think there's the other half, is it next slide please, I think is the other part of the actual, um, yeah, form which shows they um, actually that have the written the pro and B blood test results and chest rex results if they're there in the clinic and examination and what actual medications they're on or any other relevant data that would be um, necessary to time. And then if we have the next slide, please. Is everybody okay with that? Is there any questions? Okay, shall I carry on then? Right, and, and just to say, um, 
also a, a available um, community support. Um, when referring patients to the community for the community heart failure service, um, the actual and this heart failure with reduced trajectory of action will accept patients that are in LVF, which is um, equivalent or less than 40%. And these referrals, which go to depending on which GP they're under, it will be either the Haven Community Heart Failure Team or the Redbridge um, Community Heart Failure Team or the Barkin and Dagenham Community Heart Failure Team. There is other CCGs, but they would be um, obviously that we would, um, depending on the GP that are under, that we would refer them out to the Community Heart Failure Teams, but they are the main ones. Um, that we um, deal with. And then we say for patients with heart failure with moderate um, ejection, uh, reduced ejection fractions, they're looking at between 40% to 49% and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is uh, greater than 50%. These would be um, advised to consider referral to community matron for fluid management and support. Um, so that because obviously these patients sometimes come in and they can come in acute admissions where they're grossly fluid overloaded and where they do need some guidance and um, advice on actual management of fluid overload. And I think that is the last part, Dennis, if there's any questions or... Thank you, Caroline. Thank I you. think we've... Yep. I think any that's... questions for Caroline? Yes, um, uh, we can send you uh, the, I mean, the link of all the um, community uh, community uh, referral email IDs. Everybody has a different one. All three of them have three different ones. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So can I just ask one single question? What would you do? Okay, maybe put helpful to put a date on the referral form. This was updated. Okay, put a date on referral form. I didn't get that question. What, what was it? Okay. Well, I put that, uh, I think, uh, uh, because it's uh, old forms, I think somebody said that old forms are still in use. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> if, uh, when the form is updated, the current form, it is, the date is April 2021, it's updated or 22, it is updated so that we know which is the current or the latest form to use. Okay, so basically at the moment, every, most of the surgeries, GP surgeries are providing us the current forms, uh, the referral form. So um, I will have to see what, what happened where you cannot, uh, you know, it's not updated but usually uh, we have the, the ERS, the, the form, which is there in the electronic reference um, service is the current form. We are in the, as, as Caroline has also mentioned, we are in the process of signing another form, which will clearly say this question, you know, that uh, the exclusion criteria will be clearly documented on the front of the referral form. So you know which all will can be rejected or the forms which don't need to be go forward. So that is what we are going to do in near future. But um, at the moment, we are expect accepting all the forms. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, no? Okay. So I'm... Um, I hope you guys have an understanding about what what we uh, we were talking about. What are the heart failure? Uh, what 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 do we see? How to diagnose heart failure? I mean, which are the patients you should uh, when you see a patient, you can say, okay, these are the symptoms. Um, we can get the blood test done. And the basically is if you find a patient who has symptoms of heart failure, like which includes breathlessness, swelling, and um, tiredness, and you feel. Um, patient doesn't have a history of heart failure, you can do the an anti pro PMP. And obviously, if the blood tests are between 400 to 2000, we, we aim to see them within six weeks. And the over 2000, we see them in two weeks, though we are currently our wait time is a lot more um, higher than this, because we are uh, having an influx of referral. Um, secondly, um, if you if you have, you know, um, 
in this clinic, the heart failure diagnostic clinic, what is, is, is we only see the patient who are like for, they, they're not known a history of heart failure. So if you, um, if the patient is already known heart failure and is under a cardiologist, please refer to the cardiologist um, as such. Um, can we, if you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I can, we can give you. Do you have support for patient for bed bound patient? Is it community matron? Obviously bed bound patient we, uh, for, because this clinic includes um, a patient needs to come here to see the cardiology as a face-to-face -face appointment. And uh, uh, so it's for bed bound patient it becomes very hard for them to be seen in a clinic setting. And many a times patient refuse themselves that they don't want to come in for an appointment. This can't be done by a telephone. So it has to be a face-to-face. -face. So for bed bound patient, obviously it will be your judgment and you can ask for a community echo to be done on them and then manage it on basis of that. Uh, sorry. Is there? Sorry, I could see. Is there any other questions I've missed? So any, I'm not sure, uh, we, we have a, somebody uh, message, not sure we have refer, received referral rejection due for us to refer to for an echo. Uh, so the thing is, if you think the patient is, has the, all the symptoms of heart failure and the patient has never been, and has never been diagnosed heart failure, is not under, doesn't have a recent echo in last 12 months, you know, um, has, isn't under a cardiologist, you can refer to our clinic and we will provide them an echo followed by a community, um, with, followed by a cardiologist appointment. Is, does it answer that question? Thanks. No, that's actually not quite right because uh, heart failure diagnostic clinic referrals are rejected if no previous echo has been done, even if they have raised anti pro BNP. No, um, so we we are in the pro, we are the one who triage the referral. So if we don't have an echo previously, they obviously and uh, is it uh, you you think the patient is heart failure? There must be another reason for ref uh, refuse rejecting it. It won't be that if if the patient had an echo in last twelve months. Obviously, then uh, we wouldn't be seeing um, uh, them in the diagnostic clinic because they already has an echo, and there's a management plan can be based on that. But otherwise, they should be seen in the clinic. So, if you have any concern like that, you can send us an email. Yeah, I think uh, uh, if a patient has clinical uh, signs and symptoms of heart failure, supported by a raised uh, anti pro BNP, then uh, a, a attendance at a heart failure diagnostic clinic should really not be restricted by provision of an echo from GP. No, no. Uh, we know, do, but, we, we but, don't but, ask for an echo from the GP. We don't. What if, I'm saying is that that's what's happening. I, I have been in this post for two years. I haven't had anything like that. So if you have things like that, you can um, happily, we can look into it. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about Redbridge. I'm not sure which area do you cover. No, we cover the whole three, whole okay. three CCGs. So please feel free. You can send us the name. Any more? Dr. Sahicha, do you want to say anything else or you're okay? Uh, yeah, well, welcome to feel free to, to ask any questions um, at all. So I'm assuming there's no more questions, anyone? Um, nothing in the chat box. No hands either. Um, it was a pleasure having you both. Um, or all of you three, thank you for attending. It was a good session. The sessions will go up later on this week on by next week. And everyone else that's still in the room, could you please fill out the feedback form so we can pass it on to the consultants and we'll use it for our own personal audits. Be much appreciative, but thank you. Thanks. The feeder, so here.